Hi. Hi. Uh, welcome to the state of Swift. So, uh, hello. Uh, I'm Tim. I'm Paris. You can tweet at us at ParisBA and the McJones on the bad website. Or contacts in any other way you can work out. We're Doom scrolling easy. website is probably a good bet though. Uh, so we live in Hobart, Australia, that's right down the bottom uh, of, of Australia, which itself is right down the bottom of the world-ish, sort of. Uh, we make video games, we make uh, applications, we write books, we drink coffee, you know, all the usual sort of things that people do back before the world changed. When the world is back normal, please come visit us in Hobart, it is lovely down it's here. It's awesome here. So, hi. We're going to be doing a, uh, a bit of an update on where Swift currently stands and where it looks to be heading. Swift is a uh, programming language that you may have heard of. It's a, we were released by a very, very small uh, company that I hear. Does little, something to do with little niche fruit company. Little niche, yeah. niche orchard maybe company uh, based in the, the beautiful, you know, farmlands of, you know, the south, south of San Francisco. It's a... Uh, it's a pretty cool language, we really like it. Uh, we've got a little caveat here though, that we are Swift users, not developers of Swift. We do not build Swift, we do not create Swift, we have nothing to do with any official Swift project. We just really like using Swift. Uh, so anything we say about future direction is a guess or is just purely fabricated because we are not to be trusted at the best of times. Never. Never, never trust us. Uh, but no, we, we really love Swift, it's a pretty cool programming language. Uh, the idea of this session is a quick and dirty introduction into Swift. Uh, well, Swift is a modern, compiled, multi-paradigm programming language, which is really just a fancy way of saying it's a language that is designed to be used for a multitude of things, not just one specific purpose. And can do them in a multiple of ways. And can do them in lots of different ways. And it's, it's a compiled language, it's not a, like an interpreted language, uh, and it's a programming language, which you probably guessed. So let's get, let's get on with it. Uh, a little bit of history before we start talking about uh, how Swift can serve you. Uh, Cast your mind back. If you, there's like one of those like, you know, do, 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 this do, do, is a, yeah, do, do, do. like a Scooby-Doo. Scooby-Doo, yeah. yeah. Perfect. Okay, so a bit of history. Uh, Swift was announced by a fruit company in 2014 by a man with great hair. Very good uh, hair. Very oh. good hair. Yeah, really good hair. Uh, it replaced for Apple a language called Objective-C, which nobody liked. Uh, put your hand up if you've heard of Objective-C. Just us two. Okay, yeah. Yeah, there's nobody else here, Tim. Uh, it was announced by Apple in 2014 and it replaced their programming language Objective-C and it was designed to be useful for their platforms initially, but they promised it would be uh, made open source. And we'll get to that in a second. Swift's goals were to be fast, modern, safe, and interactive, which I think means that it was designed to be responsive to like quickly prototyping something. Uh, Apple was very proud of Swift and progressed it very rapidly. And as we said, in 2014, they open sourced it under the Apache license. Uh, and it uh, you know, has a proper Swift evolution process or SE process where you can propose changes. If you're familiar with the Python evolution process, the Swift one is very, very similar. In fact, they more or less just went, we like what Python's doing, we're gonna sort of adapt it to us. And that's sort of the same yeah. thing. So they take proposals from the community for features you might wanna add to Swift and they consider them, debate them needlessly reject them and then they put bits of them into the language uh, and there's a core team that sort of has the auspices of this project and makes decisions based on what comes in from the proposal system uh, and it's worth just throwing out the core team is not all apple apple is about uh i'd say 60 percent of the core team from memory i can't quite remember the exact ratio but there are just community members who are also on the core yeah, team it's, so it's worth, not it's not an apple project anymore at least not in my mind it's worth saying it's very easy to remember the apple of 10 years ago and if you haven't been exposed to the apple of the last 10 years think that they're going to mismanage this horribly and make it a really bad attempt at an open source project they've actually done this properly this very is a, well a really good open source project that is genuinely open source genuinely takes the community into account and is a really participatory process we really like it it's very good so Swift is incredibly popular. It's been floating around in the top 10, sometimes the top five, depending on how you count uh, programming languages since 2015, uh, all over the internet, from everyone who surveys it, from GitHub to Redmonk to everything in between. And Stack it, Overflow. Stack Overflow. Every single way you can count programming language popularity, Swift floats in the top five or the top 10. Uh, and that's just growing. It's, it's getting bigger and bigger. There's, there's millions upon millions of millions and millions and millions of lines of Swift in GitHub and there's just so many developers you wouldn't believe. And not all of them are doing iOS apps, which is very good. Very good. Very, very good. So to quote the Swift core team, which, you know, are the, the, the big... The, Cheese. The big cheeses of the Swift project. Uh, Swift is about make the simple things easy and the difficult things possible. Uh, that's basically the, the gist of Swift's philosophy as an open source project. Uh, it really, really wants to be that general purpose, uh, multi-purpose programming language for all domains. It wants to do as many things as it can very well. And it, you know, it does that pretty well. It wants to be all things for everyone. Yes, and this really means it has a strongly typed system, which means you know, your, your types are very strongly enforced. It has optionals and nullable types, which makes it safe to do all sorts of crazy things with your variables. 
It has closures and functional support, which kind of makes it a functional programming language, even though it's not really a functional programming it's language. It's like a semi-functional yeah. language, yeah. I would say. It's functional enough to be useful to people who like functional programming languages and think like that. Uh, and it has uh, different reference and value semantics, so it makes it safe to do all sorts of crazy things with your structs and your classes, depending on what you want to do. You can copy them around or you can refer to them depending on how you need to. Yeah, it takes a very different approach to most uh, programming languages, I would say, and how strongly it couple, decouples the reference and value types from each other and how they work. So uh, we're going to take a little bit of a look at the syntax of Swift. Uh, so this here is some Swift code. Uh, what I'm doing here is I'm just adding up the first uh, five prime numbers. Um, what will that be? I can't remember. It'll be like 40 or something like that. Well, you like can that. run this and find out. You can run this yourself and find out. And then we just print it out. So that's sort of like the baseline Swift. And it shows off quite a few things here. It shows off creating an array, how you can just do that in line. Uh, it shows that we've got uh, implicit type. Uh, uh, type inference here, so it's working out what the types are based on that. You're seeing looping, you're seeing sort of functions. It, it's sort of like a, a brief thing. Now, as we said, uh, Swift is a multi-paradigm language, so we can do this in a more functional approach if you want, using reduce, you know, the map reduce. Some, map and reduce are built into um, the language. And we're just, you know, uh, going through all of these, cutting them up, adding them up, and seeing what we get out there. Exactly the same thing, but now it's done in a functional way. As an aside, the quickest way to test out Swift, if you want to get to it while you're watching us speak, is to use Google's Colab, which is colab.google.com, and you can play with it right there. We'll get back to that later, because it's kind of related to another project we're going to talk about. But Google's Colab means you can just try Swift right in a web browser without having to install anything. And it's much quicker than downloading, like, the quite large package. Yep. So we are not going to be going too much into the Swift language itself. That's because Tamira is giving a talk uh, at uh, 1.30, I believe. I could have that wrong. So we're not going to be talking too much about that. Go, go to Tamira's talk if you want to see uh, a more sort of introduction into Swift itself. We're instead going to be talking a little bit about um, the, the things that are happening in Swift yeah. as opposed to the language so itself. Yeah. Tamira's amazing. Go see her talk. Go see Tamira's talk. So. The first question I often get asked whenever I talk about Swift, the uh, first question I think we both ever get asked is, why would you ever choose Swift? Uh, and to do that, I think uh, we should always go back to those three pillars of Swift as they keep popping up, which is fast, safe, and expressive. So expressive, uh, ideally, I think it boils down to high locality of reasoning. This means, in theory, just by looking at the code, you understand what it's meant to be doing. So you don't have to understand the whole project to understand the individual piece. Uh, so each piece of code you can reason about its purpose and how it's going to be used without the whole picture. Um, that's uh, <laughs> an impossible dream, but I think it's one that's worth trying to aim it's for. It's a good dream. Uh, towards this goal, Swift sort of takes a very um, opinionated view of how you do this. So it is definitely an opinionated language. Um, one of the sort of opinions it has is if something is obvious, omit it, and if it isn't, force it to be so. Hmm? So uh, the most obvious of this is implicit and explicit typing. Uh, so by default, Swift sort of recommends you go with implicit typing because most of the time, all it's doing is saving you writing out those extra bits. So I've got you know a, uh, an integer here, and if we were to just use the implicit type system for both, they would both be integers, so we've had to be explicit and go, no, I need this to be a floating point. Mm -hmm. Uh, pretty straightforward stuff, any sort of implicitly typed language. So the first one is a one, the second one is 1.0 because we've told yep. it's a float. Uh, another interesting thing Swift does is I've written a quick little function here. It's called do a thing uh, with a thing and another thing. This is another one of those really sort of opinionated things that uh, a lot of people tend to get a bit angry about when they first get uh, exposed to it. But over time, most people I've seen end up preferring this. Uh, he says having not the largest surveying, uh, <laughs> survey there. Uh, it's definitely one of the more controversial things. The parameter labels are required. Mm -hmm. So the function do a thing with A and B would be different from a function that was do a thing A, B. Yep. They'd be different functions, they do different things. Uh, the goal behind this is again that locality of reasoning. You can sort of just read the function and know, okay, these are what these things do. This is one of those things that very much came from Objective-C, which was designed to be human readable from left to right and in a similar manner. And I think Swift has done it way better than most of the languages when they've attempted to make syntax readable from left to right in an English way. But uh, it is definitely a thing where I've had more than a few arguments uh, on forums and Twitter. People be like, no, it has to be like this. And I'm For like, sure. no, it has to be like this. Uh, another nice thing in Swift is everything is uh, Unicode strings, the whole Unicode yep. bang. So you can you know, have a smiley equal the emoji smiley. Uh, the language itself is also Unicode compliant. So you can also use like emoji as your variables. Um, 
I mean, maybe don't do that uh, for, for just, I think that makes things confusing purposes, but uh, you might be able to get some sort of use out of it. So it's, it's nice to know that it's there's there. There's lots of good like internationalization, localization reasons why Swift's Unicode for UTF-8 support, you know, is very good uh, and is not something you should just use to make all your variables named after emoticons or I mean, emojis. They call it, them emojis now. Emoticons are from like 15 years. What am I talking about? Yeah. Emojis. Maybe, maybe we're old now. I'm very old. Personally. Very old. Yeah. Uh, so Swift is also fast. That was one of their, their core pillars. Um, so I wrote what I'm going to call first attempt code to find uh, the number of steps in Collat's numbers. It's also known as the three n plus one conjecture. Uh, I've written it like this. Hopefully this is pretty straightforward. What this does is this is a very simple function which gets a number. If it's even, it divides it by two. If it's odd, it times it by three and then adds one. Uh, and then uh, what the goal is, is to keep reducing this number until you get to one. And when you get to one, you stop. And then it returns how many steps it took to do that. And there's sort of like, there's a bunch of interesting math sort of stuff behind it. It's, it's an open problem. Does every number always reach one? So on and so forth. Uh, but I like using it as an example code because it's something that if you told someone the problem, they would know how to program it as soon as they've learned basic uh, sort of programming skills. So you can sort of figure it out. And it's a really good example of comparing what I'm going to call apples to oranges uh, <laughs> tests. You apples. can compare. Ah, I didn't even make that joke intentionally. Uh, so here I am, I'm running through all the collapse numbers, trying to find the biggest uh, from you know zero to a million, or two to a million. This is a very naive approach. You could definitely speed this up with some kind okay. of obvious tricks, like for a start, an even number can't be the biggest. It's yeah, pretty mm -hmm. straightforward, so on and so forth. Uh, so I rewrote this, I wrote it in Swift, I wrote it in Rust, I wrote it in Python, and I wrote it in C. Uh, and then I compiled the Ross, Swift, and C. Uh, Python, I ran it through the C Python interpreter. And we saw what we get. And like, this is not me picking on Python. Uh, Python's a great language. And this is a very unscientific benchmark. It's yeah. just a desire to give you a quick idea. I ran them each for 100 times. I ran the Python one for 10 because I got bored. Uh, average of times got these numbers. Um, so realistically, Swift, Rust, and C all appear to be as equally fast with each other. This was just timed on my MacBook using the time command. So it's not like it's a particularly scientific tool, but it does sort of give you a, what I'm, what I'm gonna sort of call the, the real world approach. If you were going, I wonder how quick Swift is, you would probably at least for your first attempt do a setup like this and you'll see how quick it is. So it is as fast as Rust will see in my mind. Um, uh, there were a few interesting sort of things while doing this because I'd never really directly compared them before. Uh, Swift took longer to compile than the other two compile languages. Not sure why. Um, yeah, you know, it's just one of those interesting things. The argument that you have to be C to be fast is no longer true. That's true both with Rust, but it's also true with Swift. Uh, and I mean, you could trivially speed this code up itself a, a lot of ways. If, as well. if you want to take anything away from this very unscientific, as we said, test of speed, it's that Swift is as fast as C for most things, which is, as we all know, crazy fast. Uh, Swift's compiler, however, does take its sweet time compiling. Yeah, it, it is a little slow. It is a slow compiler. Uh, but in, in you know running actual things that uh, take a lot of computing resources, Swift can, under most conditions, be as fast as Swift, uh, C. Swift can be as fast as C, and that's a very good thing. Swift competing with C means you have a language that is a lot more expressive, safe, and easy to write than C that can do C-like things, and that's a really good, useful thing to have these days. Okay, and then the final thing that Swift has as one of its pillars is safe. Uh, and it means safe in almost any sort of way you want to look at it, not just memory safety. Uh, so it has a whole bunch of things. It's got your standard sort of type safety. If you've used any strongly typed language, you'll be like, yep, of course there's a compiler error. What mm -hmm. does two plus a string mean? Uh, you're all sort of used to that sort of stuff. One of the more interesting things is that optionals are built directly into the language itself. Uh, so you don't have to use different libraries. You don't have to wrap them in sort of like optional generics. It's all sort of built in natively and it's got convenience uh, operators around that. So while this is perfectly fine because we've got an integer and we're adding one to it, it understands what that is. Int plus int is always int. Uh, what we've got here is we've got optional int. That's what that question mark at the end of the, uh, the type declaration is. That is saying this is an optional int. Now, optional int plus int is a compiler error because you can't have the abstract concept of an int with something that might be an int. How would the compiler know what it yep. is? It would either have to unwrap it and check, which you know is weird and it doesn't know how to do that without you telling it, or 
it has to do something weird. So instead it throws a compile error and goes like, nope, can't do it, sorry. Compile errors are a really good thing in Swift because they tell you that you've done something wrong and it's likely to cause a problem at runtime and make you fix it, yep. which is really a philosophy of Swift. Um, so Swift also has this concept you don't see much in many other languages called a guard statement. Uh, and this is one way you can sort of deal with optionals. You can uh, unwrap them. So in this case, I am taking the optional sum value from before and then forcing it to be unwrapped. And the interesting thing about a guard statement is it's forced to return. So if you don't return from the guard statement, that's actually a compiler error. So basically after that line, uh, after the, the line after the guard statement, the print there, from that point onwards down, the value, sum value is guaranteed to no longer be optional. At that point on, it is now just normal in. And you see this sort of, uh, what I'm calling front loading philosophy a lot in Swift. You'll see a lot of code where it's potentially unsafe or requires some sort of tuning and setup before it can go on, where you do all that up front. You do a lot of sort of checking, you do a lot of work up front, and then you just blitz through it all at once, uh, once you've made sure it's good to go. Yeah. Um, so you, you uh, th that's not really a, a language feature. That's more how people are sort of using it. But I think it's a better approach. It's so a great approach. It means you have, you're checking in one area and then your usage of it in another. So if programmers love to complain about having to write guardlet everywhere though. They really people don't, love to complain yeah, about they it. They don't know how good they've got it. Yeah. Uh, and there's also other more convenient sort of methods and have to use guardlet and unwrap it that way. So in this way, I'm uh, just checking if it's not optional return zero for that value. Sorry, if it is optional, return zero for that value instead and then just sort of keep going along. So uh, that's a little bit of an introduction to Swift syntax. If you would like to learn more, please watch Tamira's talk either during the conference or presumably afterwards. Uh, she will give you an overview of how Swift actually works from a using Swift perspective. That is not what we're here for. We're here to tell you where we're at now with Swift. Uh, so Swift 5 to 6 uh, had its roadmap posted in January, which was you know last month in <laughs> pandemic times. <laughs> it does feel like it was last month. But it was, at the beginning of this year, 2020, uh, Swift posted a roadmap for moving from Swift 5, which we're approximately where we're at now with Swift, to Swift 6. And uh, it paints a picture of the improvements that are planned to the language. Uh, the core team is aiming to do a lot of different things. Mostly they're planning to move Swift from being a more convenient tool to do things that people are actually using Swift for right now instead of you know, bending it to their will in certain ways. I mean, I would, like Swift is now, I guess like complete is sort of, I'm gonna air and quotes pretty complete, mature. Um, in that you can do everything in Swift now, but there's a lot of things that aren't easy to do in Swift and that's sort of their core goal right yeah. now. Things like the compiler speeds, like they take a little bit too long at times, you know, those sort of things are what they're currently working on. Okay, so even my clicker works, we will move to here. Swift 5.3 is uh, the current version of Swift. It was released in September, which was apparently last month. Uh, it is probably, we're not sure, because again, we don't work on Swift directly, uh, probably the last update to Swift 5, the last major one before Swift 6. That's where we're at currently. Swift 5.3, very good, powerful languages available for Windows, Linux, and Mac OS, and possibly other platforms as well. It's really cool. You can go download it at swift.org. So beyond quality of life stuff, Swift's future plans are in two major areas. The first one is systems development, the systems programming language, you know, like Go. And the other one is data science, where it really wants to eat Python's lunch. Um, there's lots of new libraries and projects, like it's almost an alarming rate of new libraries and projects in Swift Lake. Like every day I wake up and check Twitter and something new has come out from the Swift team. And most of the things that are coming out from the Swift team are trying to support one of these two kind of core aims of Swift, either systems or data science. So we're gonna take a quick look at some of those libraries now because they're all really freaking cool. So, libraries. Swift, most of Swift is built up out of libraries. Uh, this is probably coming from Apple's influence because Apple loves this thing called frameworks. Swift libraries are technically little frameworks. Uh, they're libraries. L libraries and easy yep. words. Uh, some things that are, exist as a Swift library kind of feel like to people from other domains that they might necessarily be part of the language, but they're just a library in Swift. Swift is really big on this. The, it's, it's one of those kind of weird things about Swift. A lot of the things, like a lot of the core types and a lot of the core functionality that come with Swift when you, you know, download the, the compiler tool chain and that sort of stuff are technically libraries, even though they're, for all intents and purposes, core parts. It's just sort of like, not so much a quirk, it's, it's a philosophy they follow. Lots of, lots of little libraries that combine together into one big thing. It makes no practical difference to you using it anyway, so. Mm. Uh, so yeah, if just something feels like, man, that should be in the core library, that's, that's, it probably is, is the thing. Okay, so Swift on Windows. Ta-da! This is huge. Massive. Uh, as a Windows developer, if you're wanting to use Swift, you no longer have to install Docker. 
which is big enough news on itself, right? That's a really good thing. Uh, this is massive, right? So Swift for Windows is now available. It's fully out there. You can even use it to build Windows GUI applications. That's amazing. Look at this calculator. Isn't it amazing? So this calculator GIF uh, was from the official, hey, we're on Windows announcement because they wanted to show we're not just getting the core compiler to work. We're also hooking into operating system yeah. calls. It is actually working on Windows, you know, properly, whatever that's If you go to Swift.org and check out the blog post, uh, which I think is possibly linked on this slide, you can see how much work they put into this. But this is a proper Windows app written in Swift. Apple and associated teams with Apple love to write calculators as demo apps. It's a long standing yeah, Not sure why. Going back like 30 years now. Not sure why. It's, it works though. Uh, this is really cool though. This is this is phenomenal progress uh, for Swift. And as an interesting aside, uh, the lead person responsible for the Swift for Windows on the core team is not from Apple. They're from an, you know, an external body. And it's great that sort of Windows is be being taken seriously. Yeah, this is a sign of a healthy project, and this is really good. Uh, another thing that's come out is Swift on AWS Lambdas. Uh, this is still in beta, but it works. So if you love serverless, you can have serverless Swift, uh, which is pretty cool. We, we don't do that much of that ourselves, but it's a really, really important space for a language to be in these days, and yeah. Swift supports it with bells on. Uh, Got a few friends who were very excited when this came out. Uh, in, in the actual uh, announcement about it, one of the things that was listed was Swift has predictable performance, which I thought was kind of an, an interesting sort of thing to go like, the thing we're actually excited about is the predictable performance of lambdas, which I don't use lambdas much, so yeah. I mean, Look, hopefully that means something to you. Swift is an amazing language, and if people who do serverless stuff want to use Swift, that's, that's awesome, and we're really excited for this. It's not something we personally can talk much about, though. Uh, so the Swift Server Working Group. Uh, has done a lot of interesting work about Swift on the server. They've been around for a Long fair time. while yeah. now. They're one of the sort of the older parts of Swift beyond the just the getting <laughs> working on iPhones team. Um, Swift non-blocking IO, uh, which is sort of like the core project of the Swift server working group, uh, is, is now really solid. Uh, it appears to be working fine. So the working group's sort of moving on to adding more, I guess, ancillary and supporting mm. things like gRPC, service life cycles, that sort of stuff. It's pretty cool. Uh, it is pretty cool. Another thing is the uh, Vapor framework. Library. Uh, framework, library. library. Yeah. Uh, it is the king of Swift on the web server as like a web service, web app, website writing tool. Uh, there was another one for a while, but IBM was maintaining that and decided they did not like Swift anymore. Yeah. No, Vapor's one. Dropped it. Vapor is the, the default Swift framework for writing web stuff. Uh, they've got a whole bunch of cool stuff happening, writing you know connections to MySQL, Fluent, Redis, templating tools, all sorts of really cool server-side stuff. Uh, and two members of this project now work on the Swift server working group. So it's really another good example yeah. of Swift working with the community and tying in with all sorts of things in a really good comprehensive way. Uh, and I mean, Vapor's pretty easy to set up. Uh, I just put this screenshot in here because I really like their little ASCII art logo. I, I'm a big sucker for ASCII art It's logos. a good logo. Uh, but basically the idea is you can just like write a little bit and this is actually some Vapor code here uh, where we're basically just setting up it's pretty uh, simple. to respond. All we're doing is saying, hello world, we're going to run it. Uh, under the hood, this is using the Swift non-blocking I.O. Yeah. Uh, library to actually manage it. This should look pretty simple and familiar to anyone familiar with pretty much any web framework in any yeah. language ever. It just happens to be Swift, which is a really good thing. It's powerful, mm. it's simple, it's familiar, it's expressive. Yeah, and you know, that's your standard hello world web stuff. So it, it's now in a state where you can actually start building things with it, which is good. Chef's chef kiss. Yeah. Uh, so, Swift system. Uh, so this is, in my opinion, the worst name uh, library you could ever oh, have. Awful name. Uh, but this is a low-level operating system, currently file interactions library. They want to add in more stuff over time. Currently, it only does file interactions. Now, I know that doesn't sound mind-blowing, and realistically, it isn't mind-blowing because you already know how to read and save files. Uh, you now no longer have to go over the C connections. You're no longer calling C functions. You're actually using OS level calls directly, so you don't have to bind it to C to work, which is actually a really big thing. And the really interesting thing about this is this is not a cross-platform system. So it's got different calls for Linux, different calls for Apple, different calls for Windows now as well, I guess, actually, and probably Lambdas. Um, but their goal is this enables people to write cross-platform tools. Uh, so that's why it's been sort of a focus point, because being able, having working I.O. is really, really important. And up until somewhat recently, it was a little annoying to do that on Swift, whereas now, now it's not. Now it's straightforward. Uh, so uh, Argument Parser is a very interesting, sort of a spin-off of um, the Swift Package Manager. So mm -hmm. Swift has a package manager like everything ever has a package manager now. I personally have a package manager. Paris has a package manager. 
Um, and it makes running command lines a lot easier. Uh, what you do is you define commands, the flags and types that they can accept, and then the rest is handled by the library. So I've got sort of an example here. Uh, this is the example I took from uh, the demo project on, if you go to uh, github.com slash swift slash argument parser, I mm -hmm. believe. I could be wrong about that. You'll find it if you Google it. Uh, and this is just creating a simple command called repeat and it has a couple of different flags, some options, some arguments, uh, and then basically just calls run on it. And if you run this with nothing, it automatically generates all the sort of stuff you need. So you get your little error messages that make sense. It supports uh, subcommanding. So if you want to do sort of the git style of like, you know, git commit, git add, git log, etc. You can also build up subcommands and then add them to the main command and so on and so forth. So it really just speeds up this sort of whole turnaround. It's so useful for writing command line apps. Yeah. And command line apps are a really important like part of people's workflows. It's really useful to be able to write stuff that is usable on the command line with Swift in such a trivial way without having to do all the boilerplate basically garbage that you need to read in arguments to the command line and spit out help sensibly. So this makes it a lot easier and quicker to do something really it, useful. It, it really feels like a project that was created out of frustration yeah. by, by some of the people doing command line Swift. Absolutely. Uh, but it is an official project. So this is not some sort of like, you know, third party thing. This is actually official and is going to be used. It's awesome though. So Swift Crypto, uh, Swift Crypto is a proper tested crypto library. Uh, it uses Boring SSL, which is from Google, uh, under the hood, although they've implied that might change at some point, maybe. You don't have to worry about it. Doesn't matter what it uses under the hood. Currently it uses Boring Crypto. Uh, it's designed for common everyday crypto stuff in your code so you don't mess it up. Uh, it's not meant to be an all-encompassing encryption crypto algorithm or crypto library, but it means you can make calls to things that you might commonly need a crypto library to without having to worry about the implementation and you know it will get it right. Yeah, they've uh, already said they will be accepting pull requests and, and commits and that sort of stuff. But if you're, say, just adding in a new cryptographic algorithm that's not actually commonly used, or you're adding in some sort of functionality that is not about day-to-day -day cryptography, they already said they're not going to accept it. And when I first read it, I was like, well, that seems a bit mean. Then I'm like, no, it actually makes a lot of sense. Like, this is a thing so you don't screw up crypto because, yeah. like, screwing up cryptography is really bad. It's much better to have a well-tested, rigorous working library than it is to try and do it yourself, in my mind, exactly. even if that means it can't do everything. No, for sure. So, uh, Swift Algorithms is another really useful library. Swift Algorithms is a bunch of reusable algorithms. Uh, currently, I think editor tools, not scikit. Uh, the idea is they have a whole bunch of really highly tested and performant implementations of common algorithms. Uh, it's a testing ground for things that might later be included in Swift itself, like the Swift standard library. So currently they're in this Swift algorithms package, later they might be somewhere else. Uh, so things like this, you can you know generate permutations from a set of numbers in an array. That's pretty useful. There's all sorts of scientific computing reasons why you might need to do something like this. Swift algorithms has your back. Uh, there's also, you know, chunking. chunking. <laughs> I love it's chunking. A, such a weird name, it's a chunking. Great, but you know, so it's stuff you might need depending on what you're doing with Swift that doesn't actually need to be in the standard library, but might at some point. Mm. Really useful. So Swift Numerics uh, is another one of those sort of like, you can tell it's heritage. Um, so what it does is at its core, it currently adds in the concept of real, imaginary, and complex data types into the language. Uh, it also adds in the required mathematical operators uh, support to, to actually use those. Uh, if you do care about imaginary and complex numbers, you're probably like, oh, that's, that's, that's cool. If you don't, you're like, what are those? Don't worry about it. Um, it works in a very, very similar fashion to how Fortran does it because everything that involves complex numbers does it the way Fortran really comes does back it. To Fortran at some everything point. comes back to Fortran eventually. Um, so I've just got sort of a, a small snapshot of code here. Um, in this case, I'm making, uh, I've got two complex numbers, Z and W. They're both made up of um, doubles. Uh, so we've got two plus three I as the first one and one minus two I for the second one. And you can print out the individual, the real and the imaginary components, and it understands what it means to add complex numbers together. So it's sort of, um, it's one of those sort of things where if you need it, you're gonna be like, yes, finally, complex number support. If you don't need it, you're gonna be like, why would I care? Uh, What's and a that's complex perfectly number? fine. Yeah, uh, but it's one of those sort of things that it's interesting that they're sort of baking it into the language. Because I think the last language that had it built in was Fortran, Fortran I, I reckon. I, I'm not sure, we, we, um, it's not our field, but you know, this is the thing that lots of people clearly need and Swift has a lot of powerful tools that are really useful for people doing this kind of programming. 
Uh, and then we sort of get into Swift Atomics. This is very, very new. This was announced uh, just last week. <laughs> last I believe, week, I think, it? yeah. yeah uh, Sometimes we woke up one morning, checked around, like, what have they done now? Mm. Uh, and this is low level atomic types that are now integrated into the standard library. And Honestly, you will never use these. Ever. I feel 100% confident in saying these, and you probably shouldn't ever use these. These add in support for atomic data types. Uh, often this is actually implemented using uh, direct machine code where possible, but they have had to, in cases where that's not the case, written their own. You will not be using these unless you're building concurrency <laughs> types. Uh, I feel pretty confident in saying that. If yep. you are using them, you're probably doing the wrong thing. Um, yeah. Because what are you doing? Um, <laughs> but they are very, very important towards future concurrency, which sort of leads us into uh, this next sort of topic, which is memory ownership and concurrency types. So if you've written any Rust, you probably uh, use the idea of like ownership and the borrow checkers and that sort of yeah. stuff. Swift has something sort of similar. It's been built into the language since Swift 3, which was two years ago, two or three, two or three years ago. Years ago. Uh, it isn't really exposed anywhere. Uh, I believe that's probably going to start changing. Uh, so do expect that to be a little bit more of a thing. And it, it and the Atomic sort of add into this sort of new focus that uh, the Swift team keep working on, which is they want to add in concurrency types. Uh, they keep talking about this. The way Swift currently gets concurrency is it uses uh, Grand Central Dispatch or Lib Dispatch, depending on how you know it, which is a concurrency uh, library. So you can create these uh, lightweight uh, queues and reuse them and reuse them sort of like threads and it's got locks and that sort of stuff built in. Um, but that's a, like an external library. It's not built in, so it's got a bit of a sort of a slightly weird friction to it when you're using it. It's not the end of the world. It does work. It's just it's not ideal. So the Swift team is looking at sort of building concurrency natively into the language. The form that's going to take is sort of <laughs> still very in debate. Uh, whenever people talk about it uh, online, there's it gets very hotly contested. Some people are really big into like CSP or uh, Go routines. Some people want it to be actors like yeah. in Erlang. Some people want async await. Um, the exact structure that the con the native concurrency is going to take is very much up in the air. Who knows? We'll stage. find out what happens. Uh, yeah, we'll find out what's happening, but it is definitely a focal point for Swift. Keep they are on Swift.org and... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Join the Evolution Forum and be like, hey, I got an idea about concurrency types uh, and see how that goes. Um, Actually, the Swift forums are actually really quite, really quite lovely. They're not actually yeah, that's friendly. When I first joined them, having been some sort of tech forums, like, Ooh, what's this going to yeah, be like? But good. they're actually really quite. Highly nice. recommend actually joining the Swift community if you have in interest in d d d designing a language. You know. Um, but this sort of ties into sort of like I'm guessing it's it's not really an official Swift project. Not it's, yet. Uh, it's in a third party one. So the TensorFlow team at Google have started a project called Swift for TensorFlow. It's a couple of years old at this point. Uh, it is a very viable machine learning data science scientific computing framework library for Swift and has a bunch of great Swift tutorials. The Swift tutorials on the Swift for TensorFlow website are second to none really. Mm, they're very good. And uh, Swift for TensorFlow is a TensorFlow library for Swift designed to implement all the same sort of stuff that TensorFlow for Python, which is the big uh, dominant the machine big, learning yeah. framework for Python uh, has. Uh, Swift for TensorFlow is currently a entirely separate Tool chain just because they had to do that to not interfere with the main Swift project, but most of the stuff is going back into the main. We'll talk about that in a second. Uh, Swift for TensorFlow adds AutoDiff, which is language integrated support for automatic differentiation, which is something you might not necessarily actually ever use, uh, but it's really cool because you just add a tag to the method you need and it makes auto differentiation work. This is really big for scientific work and machine learning and stuff like that. This is coming into the language, but it won't happen overnight. Right now you can use it with the Swift for TensorFlow compiler, but it will be in the regular Swift compiler eventually. Yeah, with um, with the auto differentiation, the proposal has been accepted yes. by the core team. Uh, There's a lot of debate around how it would be done, some changes back and forth, etc. Uh, but because it's such a big component, they're sort of like adding it in piece by piece as they can do it just because it, ch it touches a lot, so they don't want to break anything. Yeah. Or, like I would just say, auto differentiation, sort of like the atomics, they sound very underwhelming yep. um, because you generally don't directly use them. Uh, or in the case of auto diff, if you are directly using them, it's really straightforward. You just like add a tag and add a required function. Like, wow, I can do derivatives and integrals now. Like, <laughs> um, but the way it was sort of described to me one time in a conference was: imagine if your programming language didn't have support for trigonometry. Mm -hmm. You'd be like, why didn't you include trigonometry? <laughs> and their arguments sort of similar for auto differentiation. Why aren't you? 
why aren't you adding in support for differentiation? Why are you making the programmer write that themselves sort of thing? It makes a lot of machine learning things super trivial. Yeah. Another thing that makes machine learning super trivial is Python interop. This is so cool. This, this is one so of my cool. favorite things. So with Swift for TensorFlow toolchain actually adds complete interoperation with Python. You can import and load Python frameworks and libraries and use them just as if they're Swift. It's crazy. It, it basically means you don't have to re-implement a whole bunch of useful stuff. Yeah, uh, so it's not technically tied into Swift uh, core, but the uh, work that was done so that you could call Python from Swift and vice versa is integrated in. So in theory, any language can now use this sort of like generic bridge, I guess is the right way of mm, sort yes. of looking at it. Uh, the only one that currently is, to the best of my knowledge, is Python. Yep. Um, it does have some weird caveats. Uh, the main one I would say is anything you get back from Python is always optional. It's optional, yeah. Because it can't know what Python did to it, so it can't guarantee that things haven't changed as yeah. they've gone around. Debugging and figuring um, out what's going on if something goes wrong is also a bit fiddly. It but. is a little weird, yeah. but it's a very cool project. And it is really weird being able to just be like, I need NumPy in Python. I need matplotlib. Uh, and you just like you just start using it and then it works. It's just, um, yeah, you, start, you, you don't know you need it until you need it. And it's for a very specific audience. It works in Jupyter Notebooks, which is crazy useful. Google's Colab, which is crazy useful. And increasingly, Xcode, Apple's development environment, which is the primary Swift tool that people were using before it was a, a more diverse language. Crazy useful. Uh, so, while not sort of specific things to point to, the tooling and supporting other platforms has really been a focus uh, for Swift uh, going over this year, realistically. Uh, particularly around improving not only just the raw performance, but like the development experience performance, yeah. I guess. Uh, so this year they had a few Google Summer of Code projects, uh, along with also work the core team's done, uh, around you know improving error messaging, improving debugging, adding localization support in for debugging, which you know, it, like I, I speak and read English, so like it means nothing to me, but it means so much to people who English is not their first language yep. to have localization support into debugging. Um, they've also been working a lot on, there's now a working Swift language server protocol. Uh, so you can start using Swift in other tool chains. Uh, there's a pretty good VS Code. Um, apparently everyone uses VS Code now, so so does Swift. Yeah, I like VS Code. VS Code's great. Um, so there's, there's, they're sort of working on making the development experience and the tool support better because up until very recently, it, as a side effect of coming out of an Apple project, it was basically tied to Apple's tools. Yep. And some of Apple's tools are great and some aren't. Uh, I'm looking at UX code. Uh, one of the really, really cool things we've mentioned a couple of times is Jupyter so Notebooks. Cool. Uh, so if you go to like colab.research.google.com is I believe the URL. Um, you can actually fire up a Jupyter Notebook. Um, on Google infrastructure. On Google's infrastructure. Uh, I believe it has some pretty small You can pay for working. Google Colab Pro, I think. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, I'm a, I mostly do it for just playing around things and seeing how they work. Yep. So I've never hit the requirements of what you have to go to for pay for. But um, it's really cool to be able to A, just run Swift in a web browser in uh, a notebook. Um, having once written a Jupyter kernel they're weird. No offense to the Jupyter team, it's a really hard it's problem. Hard. It's yeah. a hard problem they're trying to solve, so I don't blame them for being weird, but man, they're weird to write. Uh, so like extreme respect for the Google team for making that work so well. You can install that kernel on your own computer and play around with it locally. It's, it's called swift Jupyter on GitHub. It's awesome. Yeah. It's really, really cool. This is a really important project, I think, not because Jupyter no like I, I like Jupyter Notebooks. I don't think they're going to overtake the world or anything. But it's really convenient being able to just send someone a, note, a yeah. notebook or being able to send them a link to a notebook and then be able to share sort of like code for learning purposes. That's a Absolutely. really big thing, uh, or at least I think it's a really big thing. This has actually been out for a while now. Ages. Um, it's just almost no one seems to know it's there. Google keeps talking about it. Um, yeah. So WebAssembly and Embedded Systems, uh, these are sort of areas which have been mentioned sort of in passing, I guess I would say, as areas that Swift wants to one day be able to get to. I would say it's very sort of like long-term goals, um, kind of far away. There is some work being done in these, especially uh, swiftwasm.org. Uh, if you go there, there is a working uh, community port of Swift that, compile to web, that can compile to WebAssembly. Um, there's still lots to do before that can be integrated. They found some interesting like sort of weird quirks and corner cases in how Swift does things that clashes with how WebAssembly does things. Um, likewise with embedded systems, there's been some work into it, 
but they're still uh, it, it's kind of it's not so much up in the air it's just there's a lot of little pieces need to fall in yeah in particular uh embedded systems don't play nice with uh lib ice is it lib icu icu yeah, lib the uh the unicode string library right um which is a massive dependency swift currently has it's the single largest like dependency in the whole project yep. and it's a side effect of wanting lovely full utf uh, uh, strings, but the, the downside is you've got this huge library that just does not play well with embedded systems. That It's going to be tricky to untangle that is part of the problem. They are looking into it. It has been listed. They filed bugs on the, the Swift issue tracker going like, hey, it'd be great if we could remove libICU. And yeah. they're like, wow, that's a lot of work. Um, we'll get there eventually. It is something they're looking at, but it's not going to happen overnight. So, you know, watch this space. The WebAssembly one, however, is chugging on much nicer. So iOS, macOS, this is a massive part of Swift. You still can't deny that. Just even it came from Apple. iOS and macOS are still huge, and this is still the most dominant area of the Swift community. Uh, I, I do think the Swift team is working really hard to make sure that Swift is uh, not a platform-specific tool in any way, and they've done really great strides with that, and that is very true. Uh, but there are some tool things that are platform-specific, and one of those is Swift UI. Swift UI is Apple's proprietary UI framework. It's what you use to build uh, UIs for Mac OS, iOS, WatchOS, TVOS, the iPadOS, OS. the Apple platforms. It's not open source. It's not part of Swift standard library, but it's very Swifty. Uh, uh, there, there's a lot of people asking for Apple open source. So yeah, Apple I think they might one day. It's a very complicated uh, UI framework that's very Apple right now, and it's really cool. You can build really complicated frameworks for your visuals with very simple code. And this is a, a really good example from Apple's website of something you can build with SwiftUI. Uh, it's, you know, it's animated, it's fluid, it works, you can scroll it, you can go into things, it's just crazy what you can do with SwiftUI. Where's all this heading? Tim, where's it heading? Good, <laughs> how could we know? Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, I think this is, like we, we sort of touched on it, we think Swift is sort of focusing on two main areas, which is data science and systems programming. I think, Swift is trying to be a viable competitor to Python. Mm -hmm. Paris said they want to eat Python's lunch. I don't think that's true. I think they just want to sit at the same table as Python. Yeah, that's while Python's they want to sit. Lunch. They want to yeah. sit with Python while, yeah. Python while eats Python's lunch. eating lunch and be like, "Can I have some lunch?" Like, I guess you can have some lunch. Yeah. Um, I think that's what they're doing. That's fair. Um, and I think on the system side, uh, I think they're trying to be a viable competitor to uh, Go for yep. the more server side things and Rust and for Rust. the more low level things. Um, I think that's what they're going for. <laughs> like, we, like, we honestly, we, we, we use Swift, we like Swift, we, we're yeah. happy to talk about Swift, we don't know, but everything they're working sort of fits into those two categories. They everything they're doing aligns do a with lot. that. They really want to do a lot. They want to be Python, they want to be C++, they want to be C, they want to be Rust, they want to be Go, they also want to be Swift. They also want to be Objective C in the back of their mind. So like, it's, it's a weird they want language. To be small talk. They want to be small talk. So yeah, it's a weird language in a state of evolution that is growing and growing and growing and getting a lot of cool features and libraries and community around it. And it's worth keeping an eye on. So. Thank you for watching our talk. Thank you very much. We're probably in the chat right now. If we remember to wake up in time. We'll wake up. We'll be awake in time. Because we're in Australia, which is not the same time zone. But uh, thank you for watching. Thanks.